Hello again, Calc 2. It's time to talk today about section 6.6, .6, questions about inverse trig functions and their derivatives and integrals. So let's review a little bit about trigonometry. Here's the graph of sine. You should recognize this. Um, it's a graph of sine. Starts at 0, goes up to 1, comes back down to 0, down to negative 1, and it keeps repeating forever. So I've drawn from minus 2 pi to 2 pi the graph of sine of x. It's really clear from this graph that this function is not one-to-one, -one, right? I mean, it clearly does not pass the horizontal line test. I mean, it crosses many times a horizontal line, so therefore it doesn't have an inverse. Well, that's unfortunate because oftentimes we have to solve problems where we have, for example, something like sine of x equals one-half. I have to solve this question. Well, I can't solve this question if I don't know how to take the inverse of sine. So mathematicians, because we can make the rules, have created the following. We can create an inverse of a function by restricting the domain of sine so that it is one to one. There's plenty of ways we can do this. I could restrict the domain from say about here to here, or I could restrict it from here to here. Because there are plenty of ways to do this, we have to agree all to the same thing in the entire world. So we restrict the domain, or we restrict the domain of sine of x from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. If I look at that, that's this range of this graph, or a close-up picture might look like this. Now, this is clearly 1 to 1. If I have that, I can divide another function, and it's called the inverse sine of of x. And this function is defined as follows. y equals inverse sine of x if sine of y equals x. But since the inputs for sine are angles, the inputs for inverse for sine are numbers. So x has to be between negative 1 and 1 and y has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So because we restricted the domain of sine, it has an inverse. Since it's 1 to 1, we define that inverse as inverse sine, where you're finding the angle where sine of y equals x. Now let's take an example. It's probably been a few years since you've done some trigonometry, but let's take a look at this inverse sine of one-half equals y. That is the same question as asking sine of y equals one-half. Now, maybe you remember from your trig class that sine of y is any angle that has a sine of one-half. Well, that's going to be like 30 degrees and 150 degrees, and minus 210 degrees, and all of those. So we can't have that. So we're looking for the answer for y that is in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And this answer is pi over 6. That's the only answer for this problem right here. So that's kind of how you do inverse sine. So sine of x has a domain of minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 if we restrict it, and a range of negative 1 to 1. And inverse sine has a domain of minus 1 to 1, and a range of inverse minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. So inverse sine of 1 half, we just figured out, was pi over 6. Now let's look at inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2. So I write this like this, and then that tells me sine of y equals minus square root of 3 over 2. Perhaps I remember from my trig class that sine is minus square root of 3 over 2. Well, there's two places. Sine is minus square root of 3 over 2 here and here. So this is, this angle is uh, 4 pi over 3 for that one in quadrant 3. And in quadrant 4, sine is 5 pi over 3, right there. Or another way to write this angle is minus pi over 3. 
Now, I want the one that is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So the only one of these angles that is that is the angle minus pi over 3. So it's important to recognize that sine is not 1 to 1. And in order to make it 1 to 1, we had to restrict the domain. We can also restrict the domain of cosine and tangent so that we get an inverse. And here's how we do this. Again, because cosine is most definitely not a one-to-one -one function, we have lots of choices of where to restrict its domain. Remember, cosine starts at one, goes down to zero, back up to zero, back to one, goes down to zero, so on. This is not a one-to-one -one function, right? So we can restrict the domain, and we decide to restrict the domain from 0, right here, okay, to pi, right here. 0 to pi gives me one branch of the cosine function. We have to agree all across the world. So this allows us to define what is called inverse cosine, or sometimes we use the old-fashioned word arc cosine to mean that. The inverse cosine of x equals y is the same as saying cosine y equals x where y is between 0 and pi. So let's look at this one. Inverse cosine of minus square root of 3 over 2 equals y. That's the same as saying cosine y equals minus square root of 3 over 2. Where does cosine equal a negative number? In quadrant 2 and in quadrant 3. But because I want it between 0 and pi, I have to go in quadrant 2. And where does cosine equal negative square root of 3 over 2? This is bit 5 pi over 6. Okay? So inverse cosine is defined in the following manner. Similarly, we can define inverse tangent by restricting the domain of tangent to minus pi over 2 over pi over 2. Note the use of the parentheses here. That's intentional. Because if you remember, tangent had asymptotes an asymptote of minus pi over 2 and another asymptote at pi over 2 and another one at 3 pi over 2 and tangent kind of looked like this. Now once again, certainly this function is not 1 to 1, right? It doesn't pass that horizontal line test. So we have to restrict the domain. So we're going to restrict it from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 just like we did for sine. But I can't include pi over 2 and minus pi over 2 because tangent is not defined there. So inverse tangent of negative 1 equals y is the same as saying tangent of y equals negative 1. Um, where does tangent of y equals negative 1? Well, it has to be between 0 and negative pi over 2. So it has to be at minus pi over 4. Now, all this is great to just remind you a little bit about inverse trig functions. Those are nice, and you know you might be saying, well, I can just go to my calculator and figure this out. And yes, that's true. But this idea of where the domain is restricted and how inverse functions works is important when we look at the calculus of inverse trig functions. So let's talk about that. So the first thing I want to do is define the derivatives of each of these inverse trig functions. And here's the first one you should know. The derivative of inverse sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I never remember this formula. The only way I remind myself is by knowing the proof. So I'm going to prove this to you. I want to find the derivative of the inverse sine of x. Well, I'm going to do this in a little bit of a clever way. I'm going to let y equal inverse sine of x. That's the same as saying sine of y equals x, by definition. Now I'm going to take the derivative of this, but I'm going to do this by implicit differentiation. Remember that? You use implicit differentiation when you want to take the derivative and you have a function, a variable other than x. So we're going to treat y as if it's a function of x. So what's the derivative of sine? Well, the derivative of sine is cosine, right? And the derivative of y, then, is dy dx. And what's the derivative of x with respect to x? That's 1. So dy dx 
equals 1 over cosine y. And you might be saying, now wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't look like this answer. But I'm going to go back to this notion right here. And this time I'm going to go back to trigonometry and look at a triangle. Now notice this says sine of y equals x. So y is an angle. Let's make y that angle right here. And maybe you remember from trigonometry that sine is the opposite side over the hypotenuse. And since sine of y equals x, or another way to write x is x over 1, I can write this as the opposite over the hypotenuse. Now, use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out this side. This side squared plus x squared equals 1 squared. So this side squared equals 1 squared minus x squared. 1 squared is 1. x squared is x squared. So this becomes the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now, what is the cosine of y? Cosine, if you remember from your trigonometry, is adjacent over hypotenuse. Here's y. Adjacent over hypotenuse is square root of 1 minus x squared over 1. So here you have the proof. So this is the derivative of inverse sine. Okay? By a very similar proof, you can get the derivative of inverse cosine is minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Notice how close this is to inverse sine. And the derivative of inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. This one is the most common function of all to use, is inverse tangent. If you think about that, when you have a triangle, you have opposite over adjacent. Those are easy things to measure, usually. So, um, oftentimes, tangent is the most common one. Okay. So, there are also inverse functions for cotangent, cosecant, and secant, but we're not going to, to cover these. And since we have the derivatives, we can develop some integration formula. Since I know the derivative of inverse sine is 1 over 1 minus x squared, square root of 1 minus x squared. I know the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is inverse sine, and the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared is inverse tangent. And again, this is the most common. So let's do a few calculus examples where I do some inverse functions. Differentiate this. Well, this looks really complicated, doesn't it? I'm going to put in some parentheses for x of emphasis. And you notice, this is a composite function. This is the inner function. This is the outer function. So when I take the derivative, what rule am I going to use? I'm going to reuse the chain rule. So that's the derivative of the outer function. Times the derivative of the inner function. And what's the derivative of inverse tangent? Well, look back a little. That's just 1 over 1 plus x squared. So there's my derivative. I can simplify if I want to. Let's do a few more. Oh my goodness. Differentiate this. f of x equals x times the natural log of arc sine of x. Oh, that's crazy. Now, I do not like the word arc sine. Arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent mean inverse sine inverse cosine, inverse tangent. So I have a tendency to like to look, write this one down. Now, if you read this to yourself, x times ln x, you'll notice that this is a product. So I'm going to look at the first function as x. Its derivative is 1. The second function is ln times inverse sine of x. And that's the one that we have to do the derivative of. Again, I'm going to need the chain rule for this derivative. The inner function is sine, inverse sine. The outer function is ln. So the derivative of log, ln, is 1 over. So 1 over inverse sine times the derivative of inverse sine, which we just determined was this. Now, to do this, I need to do the product rule. So the product rule would be the derivative of the first, times the second, 
plus the first times the derivative of the second. And here's the derivative of the second right here. Again, messy, but just applying these rules. Let's do some integration. This one looks awful, but notice it, the derivative of inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. So I can think about this as inverse tangent of x times 1 over 1 plus x squared. So I'm going to let u equal the inverse tangent of x. Then du equals 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. So looking at this, I can see this integral is none other than u times du. And the integral of u times du is u squared over 2 plus c. So that's going to be inverse tangent of x squared over 2 plus c. Good enough. So that is my first one, simple u substitution. These types of integrals are actually really common, as we will see later. One of the ways to do this is to see if I can rewrite it in a way that it looks like 1 over 1 plus x squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor this number 16 out of the bottom. Then I'm going to take the 1 16th out. And then I'm going to write this. OK? Now, if I let u equal x over 4, then du equals 1 quarter dx, or dx equals 4 du. Now let's do some substitution. 1 16th integral 1 over u squared plus 1, and dx is 4 times du. So the integral of 1 over u squared plus 1 du is inverse tangent. So my final answer is 1 quarter inverse tangent. And I'm going to plug u back in to this. OK, so again, as you see, this inverse tangent shows up quite a bit. And that's because it really is kind of an important function. Um, let's do this last one as an example here. I want to evaluate cosecant inverse cosine of 3 fifths. And I, w I really want you to try to do this without a calculator. So I'm going to let y equal that inner part right there, inverse cosine of 3 fifths. So that tells you cosine of y equals 3 fifths. Now, as I did a minute ago, I'm going to draw a triangle. y is the angle, right? And cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's 3 over 5. And if you find this side by using the Pythagorean theorem or remembering, this side turns out to be 4. You can take 25 squared, 16 squared, 9 squared, that works. Now, what is this asking? This is asking cosine, a uh, cosecant of inverse cosine of 3 fifths, or cosecant of y, because y equals inverse cosine of 3 fifths. Now look at this triangle. Cosecant is 1 over sine. And sine is opposite over adjacent. So sine is 4 fifths. So 1 over 4 fifths is 5 fourths. I have done this problem without resorting to my calculator. I hope that you find this useful. Feel free to contact me via email if you have any questions about these homework problems. Thank you.